This episode is sponsored by Audible. With each new year we celebrate the forward march of time, and for some civilizations that march may already have been a very long one. So today's episode makes the start of our seventh season here on Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I am your aforementioned host, Isaac Arthur. Way back in our second season, when we first started doing weekly episodes, we had an episode called Civilizations at the End of Time, Black Hole Farming, which was long our most popular episode until being passed by its sequel, Iron Stars. The End of Time series is one of the most popular series on the show and looks at how civilization can survive the death of worlds and stars, the encroach of entropy, and last till time ends or at least has no meaning. Uh, This is an important concept of which our current understanding in cosmology leaves a lot to be desired. There is no end of time per se, just a point where things have run down so much you couldn't even find the energy or raw materials to build a clock or calendar, let alone support anyone who would have a use for such a thing, and that series looked at ways to push that back and keep civilization going far longer than we'd expect. The beginning of time is quite a different story, as we currently assume it has a definitive time equals zero at the Big Bang. That's debatable too and there's a lot of theories about what the state of the universe was before that, if such a concept as before can even mean anything, or if there might have been a universe before that event, but it's generally accepted that nothing was alive and kicking here when it happened, since that event was so energy intense, hot and dense, that it made the fiery core of stars or supernovae look calm, cool, and sedate. On that same note though, late universe civilization would regard our current era as so short and hot and dense that the period of star formation would simply seem like part of that Big Bang too. So we will play with the notion a bit today and ask if life could have developed or even existed in those minutes right after the Big Bang, or might have in Big Bangs in other universes. Though we will principally ask today what is the earliest period in which biological life might have formed. We will also ask about some big questions, such as might folks have survived an earlier universe and migrated here, or even made this universe as their new home or at least their legacy, and might we survive our universe's eventual death by doing the same. One key point we focused on in Civilizations at the End of Time that applies equally well to the beginning of time is that the basic mechanisms of biology and cognition will operate on timescales depending on the rate at which the switches fire and flip. For example, all neurons fire about 200 times a second so the basic scale of human thought and our ability to perceive events is in the millisecond range. If you live in a nearly dead universe of hypercord and hyper-efficient computing, you can support a whole civilization on a light bulb instead of a star by just running it very slowly. The analog of neurons firing might occur on the order of millions of years, so a thinking process might last for trillions of trillions of trillions of years. The converse is very likely true, that early in the universe, when the energy density was high and ambient entropy was much lower, life of that era might have been based on the subatomic scale interactions taking place in trillions of a second or even less, resulting in an epoch of the universe lasting literally only an eye blink to us, but permitting some mind built upon that scale to have experienced what we could only experience in eons. If such life or civilizations ever existed, they could only have lasted in that form for as long as the universe was hot enough, dense enough, and low enough in entropy for them, and if they did endure and adapt to the rapidly cooling universe, the adaptation would be so extreme they would be unrecognizable from their original forms, much like for the example of originally human civilization adapting to conditions at the end of time as post-biological life. We'll return later to contemplating the very earliest things that might have qualified as life, but for now let's contemplate how early in the universe biological life as we know it might have begun. We can rule out the first 300,000 years of the universe easily enough, which is handy because that's a period we cannot see, the time prior to what we call the last scattering, and indeed the reason we cannot see it is the same reason we could not have had biology back then. Back then the universe hadn't expanded very much, though by this we mean our observable universe, a point that will matter later too. Since the universe was quite small, it was also ultra-hot and ultra-dense, so there was no complex chemistry going on. Prior to last scattering you could not even have had a water molecule or any carbon-based molecules because the universe was hotter than the surface of a sun still, indeed it was too hot for atoms to even form. Once it spread out enough that atoms could form, and the photons being radiated by all that heat became more likely than not to fly through empty space rather than scatter off that early matter, 
Before the last scattering, the universe was filled with hot matter emitting photons, but as is the case inside a star, the photons were almost immediately absorbed and re-emitted over and over by surrounding matter. At the last scattering, things cooled and thinned enough that most photons being emitted wandered around without hitting anything and continued to do so. We can see those early photons to this day, as they are still arriving hither and thither throughout the universe and will always do so, just ever more weak and redshifted. Nowadays they are redshifted down to microwaves and form a constant background radiation in the cosmos, what we call the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation or CMB, a universe-wide phenomena. From a time and space sense it is a wall we cannot see beyond, or before, but there were no civilizations there to see because there were no atoms and molecules to build them out of, so no carbon-based or water-based life, nor options like silicon semiconductor life or any other alternative forms of chemistry we contemplated in our episode Non-Carbon-Based Life. It was just too hot and dense for such things to exist. There also wasn't the right type of atoms. Our Universe is mostly dark matter and has been since its inception, but dark matter is not a good candidate for life, especially fast forming and acting life so we'll skip it today. Most of the early mundane matter wasn't a good candidate either, the Big Bang and its immediate follow-up would see the formation of just hydrogen, helium, and lithium, and very little of the last, indeed we seem to have even less of it than our models predict, what is called the Cosmological Lithium Problem or Lithium Discrepancy. Given that our models are off on that, it is possible some of the heavier elements also formed in very tiny quantities too, and potentially in ways and fashions that might have seen them getting concentrated in some spots. It is the nature of heavier element formation that it tends to happen in clumps and clumps of high density and energy. Highly unlikely but maybe not impossible, and by about 10-20 to million years after the Big Bang, the whole universe had cooled to the point of being room temperature, and you sometimes hear me or others call this the bathwater epoch, as it's vaguely conceivable, you might have had enough oxygen around in some places to form large pockets of warm water in which very tiny amounts of heavier atoms might concentrate and permit some chemistry and thus life. Though I'd emphasize that this is one of those things that's possible only in the sense that we can't flat out say it is impossible that this might have happened somewhere in the vast universe. It's also one of those possible primordial events in other universes, The conditions of our Universe will very likely depend on the tiniest variations in certain physical constants, and one in which if the formation of heavier elements in the Big Bang, Big Bang Nucleosynthesis, were even a little more preferred, could have resulted in such a Universe having trillions of muddy warm water worlds forming an early and warm Universe, and if expansion was a bit slower there they might persist for eons and permit evolution. For us, even if life did miraculously form then, it would probably have frozen soon after and at best potentially been revived or survived by proximity to one of the first stars forming millions of years after the Bathwater Epoch, then perhaps being blown about the galaxy by the detonation of that star and world in those first supernovae that gave us real quantities of heavier elements. There was a long time period between the Bathwater Epoch and star formation, but large clumps of matter like planets take parallel times to cool down so you might have had a remnant of life in some giant ice ball near its still warm core, and keeping life around to the start of star formation. That is generally thought nowadays to be about 250 million years after the Big Bang, and we revised that figure down from more like half a billion to a billion in the recent years. 250 million years is still a long time but it is only about 2% of the age of the current Universe. If we're thinking of all the age of the current Universe as a single day starting at midnight, and now as that second midnight, then the last scattering event was about 2 seconds into the day, the Bathwater Epoch between 1-2 to two minutes, the first star formation about half an hour into the day, the formation of Earth and primordial Earth life around supper time, the invention of fire a handful of seconds ago, and the dawn of recorded history less than an eye blink ago. So needless to say, if any civilization arose around those early stars, or the second generation after supernovae, let alone that bathwater epoch, they'd have had one heck of a head start on us. Based on what we know though, when could our style of biology have developed? Well that's a tricky question because it's all about probabilities and we don't know what the odds are. We can assume there's a decent chance in all the grand universe of billions of billions of stars that there's a few freak rocky planets formed early on, potentially inside that first billion years of the universe. We often say that it took a lot of supernovae to get us all the rocky material we have now, but that's not entirely true. 
Supernovae send out dense waves of heavy matter, many generations of them do seed an area with lots of heavier elements to make high metallicity stars common and rocky planets plausible, but generally the heavier elements in your local neighborhood will have come from one specific supernova, not a whole ton of them slowly raising the galactic average. Which they do, but it is entirely plausible a single supernova could result in a rocky planet, though with a narrow range of elemental distribution, as not all heavy elements are produced by exploding stars, nor does each exploding star produce the same ratio of elements. Plus, star formation tends to occur in clumps, meaning supernovae do too, so it wouldn't take that many stretches of probability to create a solar system like our own inside that first billion years of the Universe, maybe in the first half a billion. We don't know for certain that life needs a rocky Earth-like planet to form on, but that is where we know life has formed and where we expect to find it. We have plenty of examples of high metallicity stars, where we'd expect to find high metal planets like our Sun, that are more than twice as old as our Sun. They are not common, but they're not ultra-rare either. And that's the thing about the first case of life, as we examined in our episode Fermi Paradox Firstborn, the early Universe was not very fertile for forming life-bearing planets but it becomes more fertile as it ages, so that first life-bearing planet, whichever planet that was, was almost certainly very atypical of planets that existed in its time. It was a first of its kind, formed when the Universe was only just beginning to produce planets of that kind and produce them only rarely. When pondering the Fermi Paradox, the big question of why we haven't found any alien life yet, when the Universe appears so old, immense, and fertile, we have to not only consider that the firstborn life in the Universe was probably a statistical fluke for its time, but that we might be that lonely fluke. We do not know that the development of life as we know it is even vaguely probable, we have some theories saying so, however most of those begin from the assumption that it is probably natural and work from that which is a good approach but also logically dubious. One critical notion in considering the emergence of biological civilization is that they follow Darwinian evolution, from primordial goo to building spaceships, and that they not only do that, but do that on something like our timescale. But the timescale of Earth life has a lot more to do with the speed of cellular reproductive processes than basic organic chemistry, from which it is an emergent property, and we can't even take for granted that other life runs on organic chemistry. If proto-life in some other incarnation elsewhere in the Universe ran on a slightly different approach that resulted in generations taking ten times as long, or a tenth as long, those are likely to be magnified in speeding or slowing the progress of life. But even if they weren't, it might mean most worlds see their star burn out before life even gets multicellular, or the reverse, they can spring up so fast to complexity that they're building spaceships only a few million years after the ocean's cool enough to allow a primordial soup to form. If some life formed as a naturally occurring semiconductor or superconductor vein on some planet, how fast does it experience time? Hypothetically you could have rafts of mostly silicon, floating on planets still boiling as magma, from their formation near millions of years after the first giant star exploded to scatter that silicon, and such stars themselves don't live long either. If the first stars formed 250 million years into the Universe, the first and biggest of them would have detonated and scattered plenty of silicon and other heavy elements only a few million years later. But this notion of life not even working in the conventional biological sense, but being more like a naturally occurring computer, reminds us that you do not necessarily need silicon for computers either. Heck, our first ones worked on vacuum tubes anyway. If you can arrange for matter to make a switch, a simple on and off under some stimuli, then you can create the most basic element for potential life. You can do that mechanically, biologically, with a transistor or a vacuum tube, heck you can even do it with black holes. It doesn't necessarily have to run on what we think of as normal chemistry or even normal matter. And if it doesn't, that gives us some other options independent of the Universe aging enough to cool down for chemistry to be possible, and for dying stars to give us some new atoms and chemicals to add to the mix. As an example, I mentioned earlier that when we talk about the Universe and Big Bang as some point-like event from which everything emerged, we just mean our observable Universe. I'm not even talking about other Universes or realities here, we only know the parts we can see emerge from something much smaller. We speculate it was point-like, though there's some debate on that, as well as what we mean by that. That does not necessarily mean the Big Bang or our Universe started from a single point though, It's entirely possible the primordial universe was infinite in size already, and has simply continued to expand, and the chunk of it we can see now just used to be smaller and since expanded as did the rest of it. It's also worth remembering the observable universe isn't a set size either, 
and I don't mean the sense that stuff in it is expanding. If you're taking mass measurements or galaxy counts as the universe ages, you'll see both dropping, because while we can see further and further every instant as light reaches us from further places in the universe, our edge to the observable universe is the place at which space in between us and it is expanding faster than light from it can cover the distance. The observable universe a billion years ago was a smaller one, but also a more massive one, and a good deal more crowded and vastly so in the early universe. Now the universe is not homogenous and evenly distributed, even beyond local space like planets and stars you have got galaxies and superclusters and so on, and it's been like that since the inception. The source of some puzzlement and reason for theories like cosmic inflation in the first instance after the Big Bang. But at a big enough scale features break down and everything looks like noise and static, what we call the end of greatness. The resolution or pixel size of the Universe in this sense is around 300 million light years. If we divide the Universe into 300 million light year pockets or 3D pixels or voxels, the observable Universe would be composed of a few million of these pockets. They're not identical, any more than snowflakes are, but there's nothing of significance and structure to distinguish them. They were smaller in the past, much smaller, again we believe non-homogeneous distribution of the Universe occurred from the tiniest instant of time after the Big Bang, but assuming the Universe doesn't magically end right at the boundary of what we can currently see, there would have been a lot more of these pixels in the early Universe. Let's assume in those earliest moments that each such region represents something like a switch or a neuron of which there were many billions or trillions or even an infinite number, and many close enough to interact. Something like a universe brain. That's a very wasteful approach to computing when you're using something in galactic mass scales just to flip a bit, but it's not entirely impossible that those tiny little fluctuations in space-time, in that early cosmic inflation, resulted in something like a Boltzmann brain, thinking at incredible speeds, and able to exist at those earlier insane temperatures and timescales because it's not running on matter. It presumably would have been torn apart in short order, but again it's not raw time in terms of seconds or years that matter, but raw processing or events, switch flipping, that controls time in terms of thought and personal existence. Incidentally, as immense as the scale involved is, this is not indicative of a godlike intelligence, Again, the implication is it needs whole galaxies to be a single switch in a computer. In an infinite or big enough universe that might be godlike, but in terms of IQ per unit of mass, as it were, it would be ridiculously stupid. Alternatively, perhaps it was super smart, smart enough to run simulations of the fate of the universe in the distant future, or present, and this would seem to be the earliest possible version of the simulation hypothesis, see the simulation hypothesis episode for more on that subject. In this universe anyway. Play around with the initial physical constants and you could get a Boltzmann Brain of breathtaking scope emerging out of a Big Bang. See our Boltzmann Brain episode for discussion of these freak coincidence sort of minds. But since we're talking about other universes, let's talk about folks migrating into this one as source for early life. Now how they would do that and from whence they came we'll consider academic for now as we've no idea, but let's say they were reasonably like us coming from a universe with similar basic laws only order and they found a way to make the trip. How old does the universe need to be to migrate to it successfully? You might assume you could start moving in as soon as the first stars formed, but this is probably wrong in both directions. If you're looking for planets and raw materials heavier than hydrogen and helium, you'd best wait a while, but you probably don't need stars or heavier elements at this point. Odds are if it's possible to make fusion work profitably as a power source in something significantly smaller than a star, we'll figure it out in the next century or two, and if you can do that then a universe of raw hydrogen is one in which you can gather fuel to run your reactors, and fusion is called that because it fuses lighter elements into heavier ones the same as stars do, so you could get your heavier elements that way as a waste product or by running tons of super colliders. So odds are even we, in a century or two, could make a go at colonizing a universe still too young to have stars in it, let alone some species thinking about making or traveling to other universes, as most of our theoretical models that conceive of such things do that through playing with black holes, wormholes, or similar concepts that tend to all make for methods of power and matter creation better than regular old fusion. Indeed that is one of the better Fermi Paradox solutions, that civilizations don't colonize galaxies, because they figure out how to travel to other universes even before their earliest sublight colony ships could get to another star system and set up shop. It is decently plausible we'll have figured out all the laws of physics before we've reached other stars, and if those laws open the door to bigger and better options than slow galactic colonization, 
We probably would do that instead and could surmise other old or alien civilizations did so too, and such being the case we may never hear from them, indeed such being the case we might be in some remote pocket of a universe they triggered into existence and began colonizing, we may be an infestation or at best squatters in their universe. It's a lot easier to colonize a young universe, everything is closer together so you can reach it faster and can reach more of it too, getting ships to places we could never go now because of cosmic expansion. The amount of universe you can colonize depends on how soon you can send your ships out and how fast they can go, because the universe is running away from you and the further bits are running the fastest, presumably faster than the light beyond the cosmological event horizon. If they have fusion, or better, they don't need to wait for stars to form, Now the Universe was still a warm place back then when those earliest stars formed, though again that period was already more than ten times longer after the Big Bang than the end of the Bathwater Epoch when the whole Universe's average temperature was what we consider comfortable. So that might be the period you'd choose to enter, during the Bathwater Epoch or after but before the earliest stars. The game of life and being first is very different when we assume the first entrant already has technology from the outset rather than needing to evolve. That's why Boltzmann brains, absurdly improbable random collections of matter that come together to become a thinking entity rather than the slow crawl up Darwin's ladder to it, always have the edge on being the first thinking creature, ignoring that we tend to estimate that they are considerably less likely than not to pop up into existence even once in an entire universe our age. Other universes with other probabilities might have better odds for them, and if our universe really is infinite then the first thinking life form was definitely a Boltzmann brain. In our current scenario though, life immigrated, so could have evolved elsewhere, but pops into our universe with all of its technology available. How early they could safely arrive and get started colonizing depends a lot on their technology. It is hard to run matter-based technology in a hot place. We discussed how to do that in our episode Colonizing the Sun, but there at least we had the option of using the rest of space as a cold reservoir. 300,000 years into the Universe, everything was as dense as the Sun and as hot as the Sun's surface, but there was no cold reservoir, so unless your technology encompasses options for bending or breaking the laws of thermodynamics, you probably need to wait till after this period to send in your ships, even if your civilization is not biological anymore. But you probably could be in there as early as a million years if it was post-biological, and in the Bathwater Epoch, or a bit before or after if it was biological, especially given that you need to make all your heavy elements, which is a very energy and heat intensive process, and so it's kind of like trying to work in a smelting facility if someone decided to place in the middle of a hot jungle, you're producing huge amounts of heat in a place that's already uncomfortably warm. So that's probably the soonest you'd move in, several million if not tens of millions of years after some universe's Big Bang. Now mind you, with different physical constants a universe might expand and cool faster, but in such a universe you have a harder time colonizing and are more limited in what you can colonize as the universe would expand out faster and remove more of it from play. Assuming a civilization is creating it and can pick their constants, or its equivalent in being able to flip their portal to new universes until they find one with the constants they want, more or less, then there's actually a fairly narrow range of good picks. You do want one expanding as non-expanding universes are a death sentence, even if we assume one that would expand only to about our current density then start contracting or stabilize, though a fairly long death sentence in that case but anything resulting in stuff being much closer together, and staying that way, would tend to result in you eventually baking in the waste heat of all your stars, a conundrum we get from Orbor's Paradox which we may discuss some other time. If you have it expanding much slower than ours, or to much higher density than ours, you got big heat issues to deal with down the road and also have to wait longer to colonize it. If you pick for much faster expansion, you can colonize sooner but get less material available, and if it's more than a tiny bit quicker you probably never even get galaxy formation. Which isn't a problem if you don't use stars for power or plants for living on, but you still need to collect your hydrogen gas for fusing, and without expansion slow enough to allow matter to clump into galaxies and the like, you are doing your collecting in space with a gas density similar to intergalactic space. It may be initially denser but if it's expanding faster, eventually it will end up way less dense than even our intergalactic space is. You might not care about that either, if you can pop into some universe for your Goldilocks periods, not too hot, not too cold, not too dense, not too thin, then you can presumably repeat the effort after some millions or billions of years, migrating to a new universe, and you might be running on a clock too. 
Making a pocket universe in science fiction tends to show us time running quickly there so that we get billions of years unfolding in mere days, but there's no reason to assume time would run faster in some universe you spawn via induced Big Bang or hunted out of the multiverse for travel to. Indeed there's lots of issues with trying to move to some place where the time isn't running at about the same speed. As an example you might step through your portal to where the time goes a million times faster and just be torn apart by the tidal effects. So if you have to wait to go there at the same time in your own universe, getting in early is nice, and you might like faster expanding universes and just leave them for new ones if they thinned out too much. This probably counterindicates our own universe being such a thing though because our cosmological expansion appears to be accelerating, and you would probably want the reverse, fast initial expansion dropping to a crawl, but there are some big assumptions in there of course. Also, you would expect such a universe to be thoroughly colonized by now with a 13 billion year head start. The Fermi Paradox is already problematic enough normally when we just assume aliens might have a couple billion years head start from having evolved on a younger world than us. On the other hand, if you emerge into a universe, even getting into it early during that bathwater epoch, if you haven't got fast and light travel, it's already too late to colonize at all and you would have big pockets of space, like our own observable universe, that couldn't even see your civilization and vice versa, so maybe we are in some universe someone already colonized from nearly the beginning of time, and if it were possible for them to migrate universes, it's possible for us to as well, which might be one way we could escape ever having to be a civilization at the end of time. We're beginning to our audiobook of the month in just a moment, but folks sometimes ask about the music we use, and it comes from a wide range of sources, but some of you might have recognized today's selection as coming from Stellotrone, who I happen to be listening to while writing the episode, and I thought it would make a good musical accompaniment for today, and I'll link his work in the episode description, as we usually do, for the musicians and composers kind enough to lend us their work if you want to find some more of it. I may have been influenced by the music I was listening to, but the episode was inspired by countless science fiction stories of ancient civilizations or those predating even the universe itself, or trying to flee to another universe, and both are themes in Stephen Baxter's famous Zeely sequence, the first novel of which, Raft, features future humans trying to survive after traveling to an alternate universe with different physical constants, is something we discussed today. Raft is Baxter's debut novel and begins his reputation for being not only one of the most imaginative science fiction authors of modern times, but also one who sticks to hard science wherever possible, and in spite of this his Zeely sequence is one that spans eons of time and breadth of the universe while also conveying how enormous both truly are. And for this reason, Raft is our January 2021 Audible Audiobook of the Month. If you'd like to try out Raft, you can find that audiobook along with many other excellent stories by Stephen Baxter over at Audible. They also have podcasts, guided wellness programs, theatrical performances, and exclusive Audible originals. Indeed they have over three centuries worth of audio if you just hit the play button and ran through every title. If you want access to that massive collection of great audiobooks like Raft, you can join Audible for a 30 day free trial. And Audible members not only get discounts on any audiobooks they buy, but a free book every month, with a Premium Plus membership. Additionally they are now giving you unlimited access to their Audible originals. You can start listening today with a 30 day Audible free trial, just visit the link in the episode description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500500. So welcome to 2021, and we have quite a schedule ahead for the year, starting next week with a look at cryonics and what the ability to freeze people and revive them would mean for our civilization. We'll follow that up with our mid-month weekend bonus episode, Machine Overlords and Post-Discontent Societies, on Sunday, January 17th. Then in two weeks we'll return to the Alien Civilization series for a look at Oceanic Aliens. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes you can donate to us on Patreon or our website, IsaacArthur.net which I'll link to the episode description below, along with all of our various social media forums, where you can get updates and chat with others about the concepts in the episodes and many other futuristic ideas. You can also follow us on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify to get our audio-only versions of the show. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.